If I was a street corner preacher, I think I'd enjoy it. I think I'd be good at it. <laughs> I might have to. <laughs> I have to confess to you that this topic is not my own. The Reverend Richard R. Davis, Unitarian Universalist, offered this sermon online. He called it, If I Were a Street Corner Evangelist. A little more dignified title, perhaps, if grammatically questionable. I think it's was. Everybody likes to say, if I were, but I think it's was. Uh, Reverend Davis said... Um, Oh, by the way, he practices Zen Buddhism as a UU minister, so I think we would all like him very much. Uh, reminded me of Sekio. So Reverend Davis said, One day I was sitting in a coffee shop downtown when I noticed a couple of street corner evangelists setting up shop across the street. An older and a younger man wearing dark suits and ties, and wielding King James Version Bibles. I thought that his choice of the word wielding there was an often accurate term for the way the Bible is handled. Yes. So Reverend Rick, as he was known at his Salem, Oregon church, that's the UU minister, um, who's telling this story, said they, that these two men commenced taking turns preaching the gospel as they understood it. And at full volume. No surprises here, he said. It was basically, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. The unanimous response of passers-by was... To ignore them and walk by as quickly as possible. Of course, right? As we might do. Only it wasn't my initial response when I read Reverend Davis's sermon title. That's because there was a time when I considered that I could be one of those evangelists on the street. I carried my Bible around. It was a King James, but it, had, it was a Schofield Bible. It had that extra punch with the cross-references and the explanations and the column in the middle. <laughs> the Schofield Bible. I was, I was taught back then to look for opportunities to share. Not just look for them, but create them. But after a lot of liberal religious training and study in my life, I moved to the other side of the street, you might say. Reverend Rick Davis explains what I mean with his coffee shop story that he goes on with. A bit later, he said, while crossing the street, I overheard young, a young skeptic engaging those two street corner preachers in a no-holds-barred theological conflict. And I must admit, he said, I secretly cheered for the young man who was challenging their fundamentalist assertions. Way to go, dude. Sock them with some good, strong, rational arguments. Like most folks... The reverend said, I wished that these two bothersome characters would stop disturbing the peace and clear out. Quote, yes, I confess it, I looked down upon them with an air of theological condescension and intellectual superiority. Easy to do. Now see, that's the side of the street that I eventually moved to myself. Still young and arrogant, I wanted to be right. Home on break from college, I would get sent to the door by my mother whenever the Jehovah's Witnesses rang that doorbell. 
It didn't take me long at all through my theological education to move from the impassioned Christian soldier to become the equally impassioned critic. I seemed to have disdained my own history and experience, having been so recently erased from the roll call of believers myself. This is how Reverend Davis explained his opening up to another possibility about those street preachers. He said, a month or so later, I was listening to a radio show in which the narrator was describing a conversation he had with two evangelists. The evangelist asked that narrator if he remembered a scene in the movie Schindler's List in which the main character, if you saw the movie maybe you'll remember this, the main character Schindler is among all of those Jews toward the end that he has saved from the Nazis. And he is heartbroken because he could have saved even more Jews if he had sold his watch or his car or other amenities. And he is breaking down in tears asking himself why he didn't do more. The two evangelists told the narrator that they saw their predicament in the same light. And they knew that at the end of their lives, if they had not done everything they could to save as many souls as possible, they would be asking themselves why they had taken that day off. Why they had indulged in some pleasure or pastime when they could have saved someone's immortal soul from eternal damnation. Reverend Davis said, upon hearing this on the radio, I saw the two street corner preachers in a different light. They hadn't been hanging out, haranguing passers-by, just to be irritating. They were doing it because they cared. And they were doing what they honestly believed was the most important thing they could be doing on that sunny Saturday afternoon when most folks were out shopping or strolling in the park or watching a football game. And when he said that, it reminded me of people who are anti-abortion. Uh, Among them, my family members. And how they believe so strongly that that human fetus is alive. And that therefore what is happening is murder. And so they have that justification in their heart. So these two people were out there on the street corner enduring the scorn and the rejection of almost everyone in the hopes they might save even one more soul. Realizing this, said Reverend Rick, I felt chastened. I may not agree with their belief system or their techniques, but those two were out there doing what they honestly felt called to do. Give them credit for that. It reminds me of the folks I see in cars decorated with Jesus saves and Bible verses all over the vehicle warning of damnation. I want to talk to these people. I want to debate religion with them. But they want to save my soul. And that trumps everything. I used to like that term. It's hard for me to say it anymore. <laughs> Davis said he had to ask himself, why am I not doing something like this? Don't I take my own religion seriously enough to want to share its message with others? And there's the question, isn't it? How important is our faith? Maybe we don't take our religion 
seriously enough. Maybe we don't take ourselves that seriously. In fact, that sounds like wonderful life wisdom to me. Don't take yourself too seriously. Reverend Rick said he heard a colleague describe a workshop that he was at with other prominent UU ministers and uh oh and the leader of that workshop some big shot mega church founder was asking the ministers what is your saving message i think he knew who to whom he was speaking when he asked what is the saving message of unitarian universalism the room was silent the reverend said. No one could answer on the spot. This is a room full of ministers. Rick said, I don't fault those ministers because we just don't do sound bite theology too well. In some ways, he says, this is to our credit. We don't offer an easy fix to life's ill. And that whole metaphor of saving people, like Oskar Schindler trying to save Jews from the Nazis, doesn't that make God come off looking like a big Nazi in the sky who sends the rejects to the concentration camp of hell? Yikes. Yes. And so Reverend Davis began to imagine how he would go about being a street corner UU evangelist. First, he said, I make a sign that folks can read before they pass. It says, quote, I not only honor and affirm, but celebrate your right to ignore me (laughs) since I am sharing my religious views. However, if you are interested in hearing about a religion that offers reason, science, and is open to the wisdom of many religious traditions and other sources, then let's chat. End quote. Now that's funny to me. <laughs> and how much response do you think he would get from that? Possibly... Especially when they're approaching a preacher on the street. <clears throat> but that's interesting. Because I think... It <laughs> that was my homework question to you this week. <clears throat> you may have noticed this, that I've been asking you more questions recently, encouraging more speaking and relating in the worship services, uh, get answering the call for more interaction. So that's what this is about. Here it is. What would be your street corner message? Anybody? Wow. Not, we're not good at it. At least we didn't have stone silence. Yes, Rhea. Mm-hmm. We used to stand with signs at this uh, Omega Institute when they had their uh, seminars, week-long, weekend seminars, and, and we were Ask Me people, and we just held up a sign that said, Ask Me. Of course, it was related to the seminar, but that could work too. Anybody else? God is love. God is love. That's about as basic... <laughs> As the message of Jesus gets. Or any. (laughs) I'm as lost as you are. (laughs) Google is God. God is in. The soul.
But you got compassion in there, and I think that's right on target. See, we can do this. My God can beat up your God. <laughs> huh? Yeah. God is love, but He hates your sin. And, uh, that's a classic. Mm. Oh. <laughs> yes. It is a very esoteric language for people who are not immersed in it. Uh, and I and I think sometimes that that the general Christian population doesn't understand just how um Oh my, it's one minute to twelve already. Oh my. Well, I got a couple more. Let me, let me tell you what Richard, Reverend Richard Davis offered as his street preaching, street corner preaching. We Unitarian Universalists affirm that every person, that means you, has an inherent worth and dignity. And each one of us is called to see that sacred worth in others. Especially those who are most vulnerable and neglected. He said, we are called to ground ourselves in boundless compassion for all beings for all things. We're all in this together, part of one interdependent web of existence. Now that is spoken like a true Buddhist you you. He got inter interdependent in there and boundless compassion for all beings. He reminded us that Jesus actually offered a bit of paradoxical wisdom on that subject of being saved that you talked about. In a nutshell, it was this. This is Jesus. Don't focus on saving yourself, however you may conceive salvation. And there are many ways people seek to save their own skins, either in this world or the next. Jesus would have said, focus on serving, saving, helping others. For if you try to save yourself, you lose yourself. Yet if you seek to save others, you save both the other and yourself. Newsflash, Jesus actually said that. It's in all four of the Gospels in the New Testament, in fact. Things that are in all four Gospels I take to be a little bit more important maybe. What is that? How, how does that work? What does that enigma mean? It's like a Christian Cohen or something. Intellectual sleight of hand. He that saves his life will lose it or she or they that lose their life for my sake will find it. Our UU Buddhist Zen man said, if you were only thinking of yourself, you will fall into the mindset of selfishness, which deludes you into thinking you are the most important thing in the whole universe. I must be saved. And God has done all of this just to save me. It's idolatry, he says. The worship of a false god, namely you. Or he would probably say ego. That's the you he's talking about. And this attention on self above all else sustains an illusion of separateness. That word illusion keeps coming up lately for me. Week after week after week. Anthony Hopkins said it in his thing. I'm going to do a sermon on that sometime 
an illusion of separateness, the idea that we are isolated beings. But when we seek to save others with our love and our compassion, we become aware of our connectedness to the larger whole. And that's a UU message. We don't do eternal damnation, says Reverend Rick. And I'm proud of that. But personally, I do, he said, believe in hell. I've seen too many people down there or headed down that way not to believe in it. I've even drifted down to where I could feel the heat and smell some sulfur fumes myself. Not hell in the afterlife, but hell in this life. God may not send us to hell for eternity, but we certainly can create hells for ourselves and others by the lives we choose to create. So be aware of how you live. Think, act, and feel. That's a street corner sermon worth hearing. I think he said that is one of the essential purposes of Unitarian Universalism to create communities where we can remind one another to make wise, compassionate choices in our lives and not create hells for ourselves or for others and to challenge those who do create hells on earth. So to answer that mega church evangel evangelistic minister asking a room full of UU ministers what is their saving message? Reverend Davis had this to say. It is important that there be communities where people come together to think and feel deeply about the ultimate meaning and purpose of life. And our unique faith community is a place where many people People who may not think they fit into organized religion at all can find a spiritual home. And that's how important we can be. And that is a saving message. A place where the yearning for truth, compassion, and courage to confront the injustice of the world is honored, affirmed, and nurtured. Without such a community as ours, there is much good that will not happen in our world. Would telling people about my faith tradition, inviting them to join and be a part of our community, make a significant difference in the lives of those who are lost? Could this bring more hope and compassion into their world? Yes. I believe in many cases it would. The thought that I might be missing such opportunities to share something I cherish, something that makes a positive difference in the lives of so many, haunts me. And I think it should. I think that street corner evangelist said, Reverend uh, Rick, who shout and accost people are displaying poor marketing skills. On the other hand, I must confess that we Unitarian Universalists go too far in the other direction and hide our light under a bushel. Which is to say that most people don't even know we exist. Reverend Davis said, on a number of occasions, I have had to face the frustration and anger of newcomers who walk into that door and say, I've been looking for something like Unitarian Universalism for years. Why the heck didn't you make your presence known? To which he says, I respond defensively. Well, it's not my fault. Well, okay, it's partly my fault for not advocating for more outreach. I guess we don't do a very good job of this.
So what do you say in your street corner message?